In our earlier recordings, we examined the role of the judiciary as a, a core part or function of our system of governments. We also looked at judicial reasoning, that is, uh, how judges go about deciding cases in particular ways. This recording is about legal process, and that is, the structures that are in place in order for our system to work fairly and efficiently. And I'll just draw your attention to the slide in front of you. Uh, it's a bit of a caricature of um, migration and migration law people um, seeking protection orders, which is something of a contemporary phenomenon uh, in Australian uh, politics, where people uh, arrive in Australia. Uh, we have this notion of, I guess, of boat people um, arriving and then being removed to offshore detention centres. And part of the uh, the irony in, in the cartoon is that the people leaving countries with poorer legal systems where they don't have this idea of due process uh, come ostensibly to Australia and aren't treated with the same level of, of due process in terms of how their own applications for asylum, asylum come to um, come to be uh, treated by the federal government. Now it might be useful for from the outset to describe uh, the quite fundamental difference in legal systems between uh, the common law nations, uh, Australia, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, and uh, Canada and the United States. And to be honest, the vast majority uh, of nations, um, particularly those that uh, draw their legal systems from the continental um, colonial powers, France, uh, the Netherlands, Spain, uh, and Germany we have what's known as an adversarial system. In other words, when a, a matter goes to trial, um, both in the civil and the criminal sphere, the, each of the two parties brings their own evidence before the court. And the idea is that the judge is impartial. The judge doesn't actively take any part in the fact-finding process. They merely adjudicate uh, based on the evidence that's placed uh, before them. And also in our, our system, the, uh, where there's a system of judge and jury, the roles are separate as well. The jury determines issues of fact and the judge determines issues of law. In inquisitorial systems, so, and I'm thinking here in particular uh, the legal system of France, where the role of the judge is far more active and that uh, she or he can actually go and call particular people and witnesses and ask for particular pieces of evidence to be placed uh, in front of the court in order to determine what the outcome of a particular matter is. Now each of the two, these two systems, do, they both have advantages and disadvantages. Um, the adversarial system uh, has the advantages sometimes of expediency. The two, matter, uh, the two parties can bring the matter to court and it can be resolved then and there. Um, in contrast, the inquisitorial system can sometimes take a very long time if the court determines that, a, that there isn't uh, sufficient evidence and more needs to be obtained. That can be done over um, a, a course of months or years, sometimes even decades. Conversely, there is um, a problem with duplicated resources. In the adversarial system, you've got essentially two parties going out into the world and seeking evidence uh, to go to, to try and win their particular case. Uh, sometimes it can be seen as advantage of the inquisitorial system um, where the judge can direct this process to save that duplication. And so therefore they can, uh, the inquisitorial system can actually lead to reduced costs. Uh, the rules of evidence are often more flexible in the inquisitorial system as well. Now that may sound like uh, a good thing, but arguably from our tradition, where we in, uh, in Australia have very strong, very strict rules of evidence in terms of what can be adduced uh, to the court, um, perhaps uh, in terms of things being fair, particularly in criminal matters, fair on the accused, perhaps having very strong, strict rules of evidence is actually the better way. And I think another, uh, I guess, strong difference between the two systems is the concept of truth. In the adversarial system, 
the two sides adduce evidence in order for the truth to be determined by the arbiter of fact, whereas the purpose of the judge in the inquisitorial system is to actually find the truth and seek sufficient evidence in order to do that. In our system, it's important to distinguish two broad categories of matters. I'll talk first about uh, the criminal uh, sphere. In criminal law, one side, which is usually the state, um, be it the police or the uh, uh, crown prosecutors, bring an action against a citizen. Now, those two um, prosecuting bodies are the most common. Uh, however, from time to time, people can be prosecuted under uh, other forms of legislation. For example, the RSPCA can uh, bring uh, criminal proceedings against a person who may have committed some act of animal cruelty. Or local councils, which are themselves created under uh, state government statutes, can also bring matters, say, for things such as parking infringements. These are all considered to be uh, matters of a criminal nature. And there are some uh, sort of salient features of, uh, of criminal process which differ from civil process. Civil procedure is usually, but not always, about two or more parties coming together to really ask the court to adjudicate their particular dispute. Now, this subject is really about processes, about institutions and processes. So I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about certain um, procedural aspects of both civil and criminal matters, uh, both before and during trials. Now this is not an exhaustive list. There are many, many, many procedural aspects uh, in the bringing about of matters uh, to courts and also, in many situations, trying to avoid bringing a matter to the court. But I think it's useful in terms of trying to understand uh, the judicial process uh, and where it sits in our system of government to really go uh, into these uh, at least in a little bit of depth. So the first uh, procedural feature um, I'll just talk about is this idea of service. Now fundamentally uh, it comes from this idea of due process that people need to be made aware that other people are bringing actions uh, against them in the court system, both in the criminal and the civil sphere. Now, in the criminal sphere, sometimes this can be very easy. You know that you're um, going to go before the courts because you've been arrested. Uh, and so that, um, that step or that process can sometimes be removed because you are at no stage from the point um, of being arrested it is the, the process um, not controlled by either the police or the uh, Crown Prosecutor in some way. Um, there's no difficulty in proving that you were aware of a particular um, charge uh, that was uh, placed uh, upon you. And for those that are incarcerated and, and then um, are awaiting trial, there's the system uh, known as, as bail, whereby you can apply and ask the court to be let out to continue your day-to-day -day life uh, pending uh, a particular trial date to be set. And the uh, concept of, of service itself, if we really think about that in terms of the, uh, the civil sphere, it's the process of giving documents to the other party after they've been um, uh, sort of filed in the court to just make them aware that proceedings are afoot. Uh, because, to be honest, there's nothing worse than the other party not being aware, one party see, uh, having uh, judgment uh, awarded, and then that be the point in time the other party becomes aware of the proceedings. And it's quite a common uh, situation where that happens, that those judgments are often, but not always, uh, reversed if uh, an appropriate and fair mechanism of trying to inform the other party wasn't met. Now the documental process that is used in the criminal sphere where a person isn't aware that proceedings are fought is known as a summons. Uh, it's a document that served upon a person would, would basically given the power of the court to compel a person to appear. And I guess that's an important distinction uh, between uh, the civil and the criminal um, procedural rules in that for criminal matters you're obliged to turn up. Uh, it's events you can be actually held in contempt. Whereas in the civil sphere if 
somebody uh, properly goes through the process of informing you of a matter and you, you just elect to not turn up, often, if they can go and prove all of the elements of the particular action, um, they can just win and have uh, an order made out in their favour. In other words, there's no strict obligation for you to turn up, even if in, you know, most of the time it's in your best interests. Now, the next procedural feature that I'll just talk about is the idea of having particular structured documents. Uh, the Department of Justice produces documents um, in the uh, civil sphere for people to essentially fill in the particular matters that they uh, need to, all of the particulars, in order to bring about an action. And uh, as a system of governance, uh, this is useful because people who are being sued in the civil suit actually can understand what it is that the side, uh, the other side is um, wanting to sue them for. What's the action that's being uh, being brought and what are some of the claims that are being asserted in order to should justify that action. In the criminal sphere, these documents uh, usually start as police documents. Uh, arresting officers have uh, particular forms that they fill in and do in a certain structured way. And again, it's a useful step in governance uh, because uh, each of these documents must have sufficient particulars of the person who's being accused, sufficient facts involving the uh, particular event, and the offence that's actually been or may have been committed. All of these things must be included in the, the correct form before it can be brought before the courts and a person be formally charged. Now, the next feature to look at in terms of our, our system of really a good process is this idea of having time frames. There are very structured, uh, regulated time frames in the civil sphere certainly in terms of the amount of time each of the parties must give the other in terms and in, in really in for them to go about responding to allegations. And really, uh, this sounds a little bit commonsensical. You can't, I mean, it just seems a little bit uh, unfair to be able to uh, serve somebody with a document saying, we're going to see you, I'll see you in court tomorrow. Not give other parties the appropriate length of time in order to really prepare their case. Now, these sort of structured time frames, uh, they don't just extend to the act of, of, of bringing uh, the action about serving the claim and statement of claim in the civil sphere, but it also uh, there are structured timelines in terms of negotiating. Uh, most of the time, parties don't really want to go to court. They usually try to resolve a dispute outside of court in the civil sphere. And so there are these very structured timelines that people have in terms of offers. And they need to be left open for a certain length of time for the other party to contemplate the offer that's placed in front of them. And so really it's about a balance, trying to um, you know, really be able to expedite and make proceedings go and move in a timely manner. But also, uh, you know, the, the contrary to that is giving parties an appropriate length of time in order to, uh, uh, to sort themselves out, to do their own legal research, to determine how they're going to go about either defending or bringing uh, particular actions. And really just going with that idea of uh, people generally don't want to go to court. Um, a very uh, popular contemporary phenomenon is the idea of uh, dispute resolution, trying to get the parties to resolve um, their differences, their um, claims and their grievances against each other without it actually needing to go to court because courts are extremely expensive. It's a very expensive way of doing it and a lot of the cost of the court system itself is actually borne by the taxpayer. And so uh, both state and federal governments have really in recent years had a large amount of emphasis on parties being able to try and resolve things without actually going to court to the extent that uh, there's a lot of mandatory dispute resolution clauses um, that parties must um, must meet for bringing actions. An example of this uh, is the family court. Parties are required to go to mediation and obtain a certificate to say, look, hey, we actually tried to resolve this dispute out of court before they can apply to the family court to have any um, existing orders changed. 
Now, the final um, pretrial uh, procedural aspect I just want to talk about is discovery. That's really the process where parties are to a dispute are basically preparing their own pieces of evidence. However, um, there is something of phenomenon, uh, again, it's been redressed in re more recent times in terms of this idea of making the parties give documents to each other before the trial. And the reason for that is that uh, for in ye old days, sometimes the two parties would prepare their evidence, party A and party B, and one of the sets of evidence is simply overwhelming. So much so that if the other party knew about it, the matter would never have gone to court. And so this process of disclosing information and allowing the, uh, the other side to, to see it, to really see the evidence that the other side's going to rely upon, is a, a very important component um, in civil procedure. Now, it, um, a lot of these um, procedural matters uh, in the criminal sphere are established or set up in order to really give the benefit to the accused. Now, and this is a good example with discovery, because the prosecution in criminal matters must give all of the evidence that they intend to bring to trial to the uh, accused. But the accused, their side, the defence, is not obliged to give all of their evidence back to the prosecution. And I think that's a really good example uh, of a mechanism that's put in place really to protect the citizen. This theme of fairness is something that's very strongly embedded in our legal system. Now assuming that the, the parties can't resolve uh, the dispute without going to trial, there are some additional features that uh, occur throughout uh, the trial in both the criminal and the civil sphere. Uh, the, each of the sides gets to uh, really explain what their argument is. This uh, opening statement, which is made by both uh, the prosecution and defence in a criminal sphere and each of the two parties in a civil sphere, really allows the, the parties to just uh, explain what evidence they intend to introduce, what witnesses they're going to call, and what the argument is for trying to persuade the judge and jury uh, that the matter should be found in their favour. Another extremely important feature of uh, trial procedure are the rules of evidence. Now, and I'll explain these in more depth uh, later in this recording, but it, in, in essence it's uh, an area of law in itself governing the evidence being admitted to the court. Uh, evidence that, that's admitted and uh, put before the jury is really uh, the basis of how the jury determines whether a person is guilty or innocent in the criminal sense. Now, in most civil matters, there isn't a jury. Uh, however, uh, the judge who's uh, presiding over the trial is really wearing two hats. The judge is acting as both the arbiter of law, determining what the legal issues are, but also um, also determining issues of fact. And when making those determinations uh, of fact, she or he will take into account uh, the fact that some evidence is it can't be admitted, it can't be used in making the final determination. Where there is jury and a piece of evidence may be contentious, the Crown uh, and the defence will have an argument, actually have a legal argument, almost like a, a trial within a trial. It's known as a voir dire. And that is made with the jury not present because they're arguing about whether a piece of evidence can actually be put before the jury. From time to time, they'll get it wrong. And a piece of evidence that uh, may not be uh, admitted is put in front of the jury. And, and sometimes that can, that can be the basis of an appeal. And so a particular conviction uh, can be quashed or overturned as a result. Now a very important uh, aspect of uh, adducing evidence is to do with witnesses when people come and give oral testimony before the court. Now, either side can do this and when a particular witness is brought before the court uh, the other side gets the opportunity to ask them questions as well. So when a witness is called, the party calling it questions them first and then after that party is finished the other side then gets to, to do what they call a cross-examination, to ask direct questions to that person. And really that's done to try and advance uh, their own case or their own argument. Often 
where uh, a witness is being um, uh, ten, uh, offered by one side, the other side is trying to undermine or, or demonstrate a lack of credibility or inconsistency in terms of what the witness has said. Now the final aspect of trial procedure that I, um, I just want to mention is this notion of a burden of proof. Now any given action that's put before the court between two parties uh, has what's known as a series of elements. It must be brought by one side and they must prove each of those things. Now for a civil matter a party must prove all of the elements of their cause of action on balance of probabilities. Whereas for a criminal matter, and some of you may have heard this phrase before, all elements of a particular offence must be proved beyond reasonable doubt. And these are known as the standards of proof for the civil and for the criminal spheres. And again, it's a very important um, part of our our idea of having due process and particularly in the criminal sense because we try to give the benefits of doubt to the accused. Now another thing to note is this, this concept of onus. That is, the party bringing the action must prove the elements of that action. However, some other legal concepts, what we call defences and excuses, can actually um, reverse how and where the onus sits. So for example, in a civil action in defamation, the plaintiff must bring and prove the elements of the offence, but the defendant has the option of also raising a defence themselves. This idea, uh, in this case, the defence of contextual truth. If the defendant can prove that uh, the statement she or he uh, made or published were actually substantially true, then that's a complete defence to that particular defamation action. Now, in the criminal sphere, and again, this is going with this idea of uh, the, this common theme or golden thread as, as it's been described, that the accused gets all of the, the benefits of doubt and, the, and due process. The idea of having excuses for particular types of criminal offences means that in most situations the accused needs only produce a small amount of evidence. Uh, what they call they have an evidential burden to produce just a tiny bit of evidence that the circumstances involving one of those um, types of excuses, for example, that uh, the particular, say, discharge of the firearm might have been an accident. and once the uh, once that evidence is adduced to the court, then the prosecution needs to rebut that particular excuse beyond reasonable doubt. And that's the way with most of the offences in the Queensland Criminal Code. Certainly, um, uh, automatism, that is, things uh, occurring independent of a person's will, or involuntary intoxication, or extraordinary uh, emergencies, all of these once this evidential burden, in other words, this small piece of evidence is adduced to the court, must be rebutted by the Crown beyond reasonable doubt. So if the accused uh, adduces just at the barest minimum of evidence of, say, mistake of fact or accident or an extraordinary emergency or involuntary intoxication, the Crown must rebut that beyond reasonable doubt. And if the Crown can't do that, then the person uh, gets off that particular offence. It's what's known as an excuse or an exculpatory provision in the code. Now, for certain types of excuses, the accused actually has to do a bit more than that. An example of uh, an onus reversal uh, is drug law. Uh, for example, if drugs, Ill illegal drugs are found um, in your abode, you as the accused must prove that you didn't have knowledge or any reason to suspect that those particular drugs were there. Similarly, certain uh, anti-terrorism offences uh, are set up so that if a person provides money to a declared terrorist organisation, uh, it's up to that person to prove 
than it was for a particular lawful purpose, such as the provision of legal representation. Note also that as well as there being uh, excuses where a person gets completely off an offence, there are what's known as partial defences. And an example of that is provocation. When a person is charged with murder, it's a partial defence. The onus of which is actually placed upon the accused. Partial defence to prove um, that you simply just lost control. That is, you committed the act of grievous bodily harm or intended to kill um, in the heat of passion caused by sudden provocation. And if you do manage to prove this, then uh, the murder charge is reduced to a manslaughter charge. So you don't get off in entirety, uh, just the offence, the gravity of the offence is reduced. In the common law, this presumption of innocence and this requirement of the Crown to prove things beyond reasonable doubt was uh, expressed in the quite famous case of uh, Wilmington and the DPP. It's a, a House of Lords case. There, uh, the accused, Mr. Wilmington, had taken a shotgun to um, intimidate or to scare, or at least he claimed, to scare his um, mother-in-law and uh, future mother-in-law and fiance. And in the course of trying to scare them, the gun uh, was discharged and and his fiance was killed. Now, there the House of Lords um, actually overturned the original decision where the man was found guilty of murder and said that where there's some evidence of you know that this could have been an accident it's actually up to the crown to rebut that beyond reasonable doubt and uh, there's a, a really nice phrase that um, Ms. Gunsanke talks about through us this idea of the the golden thread it's this um, this theme throughout um, uh, the common law tradition throughout our our legal system whereby if there's any ambiguity or any doubt or there needs to be some sort of default rule by default the accused gets all of the benefits and so here the accused gets all the benefits if there's um, uh, in terms of who needs to prove particular parts of the offence and the burden in which things needed to be proved so that the hard task by default, is always charged with the Crown. They have the more difficult um, position in that for both proving the elements of any particular offence, but also in disproving any potential excuses. They have to do so beyond reasonable doubt. So when comparing the criminal process with uh, civil procedure, there are some salient uh, differences between uh, each of those two. Uh, firstly, that in the criminal sphere, for what's called indictable matters, matters of a sufficient seriousness, uh, enough to warrant them going to the district or the Supreme Court, where a person pleads not guilty and a trial is held, uh, citizens have by default the right to have a jury, a trial of one's peers. This is only very, very, very rarely done in the civil sphere and generally that's limited to uh, defamation matters. Uh, a second difference is that a person has served a, a summons. So when a, a person is not actively uh, under arrest and granted bail, um, a person is summoned if they're, if they're at that stage unaware of a particular uh, offence that they may have committed. Uh, it's a formal structured document that has to be signed off by usually by Justice of the Peace and that gets issued and served to a, a person. Whereas in uh, the civil sphere if you actively are seeking to sue somebody you go through a, a process of filing a document of the court called a, a claim and a, a statement of claim together. Those then get served on the party that you're trying to sue. Now the summons though uh, differs from the um, serving a claim and statement of claim in that it has the full power of the court behind it. You are obliged to answer a summons 
and uh, willfully choosing not to is you can be held in contempt. Another difference between the criminal process and uh, the civil is this idea of committal hearings. Now, basically, for a, um, any matter that comes before the courts in the criminal sense in Queensland, has to actually go to the magistrate's court first. They have what's called a committal hearing, where a magistrate hears the initial brief in terms of what the uh, prosecutors are actually trying to charge. Hey, and they, the magistrate looks at this and just determines not whether or not the issue can be proved beyond reasonable doubt. That's an issue for trial. What they're looking at is whether there is a bare minimum of evidence for this matter to actually go to trial and when the matter is again of sufficient seriousness which court it should go to um, so for the very serious offences they go to the Supreme Court and the remaining uh, indictable offences go off to the District Court. Uh, another um, I guess technical distinction between criminal process and uh, the civil sphere is this idea of, of being innocent. The accused person in the criminal sense uh, is being challenged by the, the Crown. You're being accused of a criminal offence and again this is in line with this Wilmington uh, series of rules and principles that a person charged is always deemed to be innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. That's a, a very important consideration in our system that people aren't criminals in the lay sense until after the entire process has been completed. Another important distinction, as noted earlier in the recording, is that in the criminal sphere, a side bringing an action has to prove all of the elements of their particular cause of action on balance of probabilities. Whereas when the Crown, either the police or the um, Department of uh, Public Prosecutors, they have to prove the elements beyond reasonable doubt. It's a much, much higher uh, standard that they need to, um, to meet in order to find someone guilty of a criminal offence. And finally, and I think most interestingly, is the awarding of costs. If the Crown is bringing an action and a person is found guilty, it's not commonly done that that party is also has to pay the, the legal costs of um, of the, the police or the DPP bringing that action. However, where um, criminal and sort of quasi-criminal um, matters are brought by other entities, for example, um, city councils or the RSPCA, when they bring offences, there are often provisions for them to claim costs from the defendant uh, if the prosecution is successful. However, that's it is still comparatively rare. What is far more common though is in the civil sphere the, this idea that legal costs, which are often not to the full extent of what sides have actually incurred in terms of legal debates. There's a, a, a fixed scale in terms of what costs can be claimed from the other side. But the, the general rule is that costs go with the cause so that the winning side gets to claim their costs or a fraction of what they've actually expended from the losing side. That's a um, fundamental distinction between the two spheres, the criminal and the civil. One important consideration in our legal system and our entire system of governance is the concept of openness. Courts in Queensland and in Australia, Australia more broadly are usually held uh, in open court. In other words, that citizens can come, literally walking off the street, walk into a court and hear um, the matter for themselves. They're not held behind closed doors. Now, there are exceptions to this. Certain um, private matters, for example, uh, issues to do with, say, domestic violence or to do with minors, um, uh, they can actually and usually are held in what's called closed court but they're very much uh, sort of percentage wise a, a pretty small fraction in terms of all of the offences that uh, occur and certainly most civil matters uh, are, are heard in open court as well. Now 
part of this, and part of, I, I guess it's one of the reasons so it's core and so it's so important to our system, is this idea of, of the judicial arm of government being transparent so that people can actually go and see the process happening. They can see the parties reasoning over things. They can see the adversarial nature of our system. We have uh, the jury trials so that the citizens are actually directly involved in uh, the mechanics of the court. And the decisions of the court are recorded. In other words, the judges produce uh, judgments. Um, sometimes, in, certainly in my summary matters, judges will uh, just issue oral uh, orders and then usually get their stamp and then sign those off. But certainly in matters in, uh, in the high courts, in the district and supreme courts, and all of the appellate courts, the jud judgments are all um, transcribed and so they're issued. And again, in the appellate courts, the reasoning behind uh, those decisions then you know, form, they form binding precedents on uh, similar cases that come up in inferior courts. In this recording so far, we've looked at uh, a series of procedural matters and things to do with the process in both the civil and the criminal spheres. Now, an important one for those people that wish to move into legal practice, and certainly in the civil sense, is this concept of limitation periods. Simply put, actions can, must be brought uh, in the civil sphere upon the other party, the defendant in that case, within a certain length of time. And in Queensland, and indeed most jurisdictions in Australia, most actions have to be brought within six years. And the reason for having these periods, it's really to stop people from worrying, uh, in a sense, about events that have happened a long time in their past. And for people to have uh, essentially a sense of security that matters can, uh, can simply be left alone and forgotten about. It's the length of time, is, they're still quite long, but it's certainly something that comes up in practice a lot, largely because a lot of lay people aren't necessarily aware of these, and sitting on your rights uh, can be something of a problem when those citizens later on decide that they want to bring an action to, to try and recover some form of compensation. Another sort of check and balance in our system is the concept of uh, discretion. Judges retain discretion in terms of sentencing people. They have the power to weigh up a host of factors in order to determine an appropriate uh, length of either incarceration and or um, pecuniary uh, financial dollar penalties that people have after being found guilty of criminal offences. And it's actually very interesting as a political issue, because from time to time, uh, politicians will take something of a, a popularist stance and try to express that, oh, the courts are too lenient on criminals. And again, from time to time, we'll try to legislate to create mandatory sentences uh, for certain offences and in certain circumstances. And this can be pretty problematic, because it removes the discretion of judges it essentially sometimes can form the last line of defense um, for citizens who you know, may have fallen between uh, the cracks, so to speak. In other words, uh, giving judges the power to examine a particular person's uh, sort of conduct in all of the circumstances and giving them the power to exercise that discretion is a very, very important um, means of really separating out that power of the state as a, I guess, a monolithic entity of being able to incarcerate pre people for a large periods of time um, it's a, a, essentially in an arbitrary way. Another really important component in our system of governance is the use of very structured rules of evidence in, uh, in trial procedure. Now, this is a very complex area and in fact, in terms of legal debate and legal argument throughout most criminal trials in the, in the higher courts, arguments about evidence you makes up a bulk of the court's time in many, many situations in terms of legal argument. Now, 
there are many, many rules in terms of evidence, but I, I guess the starting point, the most important one, is that not all th pieces of evidence can be admitted to the courts in order to be put before the arbiter of fact, usually the jury in an indictable uh, matter, for them to consider. And uh, the, the, that's really a two-step process. The first is to really look at whether or not any particular piece of evidence is relevant. If it's not relevant uh, to proving particular parts of the case in hand, it's immediately rendered inadmissible. You can't put irrelevant facts in front of the jury. Um, there are also uh, another series of, of rules that you look at, assuming that um, a particular piece of evidence is relevant um, in terms of testing whether or not it's admissible. So um, there are certain rules such as the hearsay rule that prevent, for example, one person repeating what another person has told them. The idea is that the best form of evidence is to ask the, the original person what it is that they saw or said or did. Um, other um, rules that come into play are rules against discounting the credibility uh, of witnesses. Um, and for example, the credibility of witnesses usually can't be attacked unless that particular witness has extolled their own virtues uh, as being credible in certain ways. Um, another another rule of evidence that uh, that comes up is the structured rules against propensity evidence. That's where um, evidence of a particular person's earlier either criminal activities or just poor conduct is brought before the matter at hand. Um, and again, it's partially that's uh, these rules are in place are really in order to protect the accused, because, for example, if a person uh, is charged of an offence, say um, a rape offence, the jury's mind would be very, very heavily influenced if it became aware that this person had had many previous rape criminal uh, offences uh, that this person had been either accused of, of and or been found guilty of in the past. And that would certainly colour the um, jury's deliberation and decision-making process. And that's really essentially unfair on the accused because the accused is only being charged with the particular offence that's been put to the court right now. Now, I've alluded to this already, but another uh, important sort of check and balance in our system is the use of a jury. A jury is uh, a group of people that were selected from the electoral roll to sit on uh, in almost all matters, uh, uh, criminal cases, in order to determine issues of fact. Jury is a right of a person being charged of a serious uh, criminal matter, and juries are used to really separate out the issue of um, the issues of fact, which are determined by the jury, and the issues of law, which are determined by the judge. And the judge will go about directing the jury in terms of uh, how they should consider particular items of evidence. And that's largely separating the two roles. The judge will go about very clearly explaining uh, the delineation between the two. The reason we have juries, though, in our modern sense is it's really about making the system more open, more transparent, and it involves uh, citizens in um, uh, you know, the determining of the guilt of particular people. And it's, it has, it gives this aspect of legitimacy to our, our system, and particularly our, our criminal law system. The person who is accused is found guilty by their peers. And that's a very, um, I think it's a very powerful phrase in describing uh, the juries. Now, it, juries weren't always um, structured in such a way. In fact, the jury system uh, used to be, um, rather than them being a, a group of 12 impartial people, juries were actually, in sort of medieval times, were persons who actually did know the accused very well. And so that it was a group of people rustled up, essentially to vouch for the person when the, um, when the Crown is bringing uh, criminal actions against him or her. 
And so that um, that mode, that um, use of the jury in our system, has really moved away from that. And much like judges, juries must be impartial. And it, the, the process of what they call impaneling juries, um, taking a, usually a large number of people from the electoral roll, calling them to the courthouse, and then the judge's associate will grab a, a, a barrel with names and pull them out one by one. And the defence and the prosecution will have the opportunity to challenge certain jurors as part of that process. Um, but really, it is it is about making, um, I, I guess, this, this aspect of our legal system something that's open and accountable um, to the community and to society. I really want to talk now about this broader concept of due process. Now, this is a, um, a foundational concept in our, I guess, in our system of governance, in that it is a, a series of related concepts that are um, sort of combined together to provide fairness in how the citizen is really treated by the system as a whole. And so, for example, in the criminal sense, it's the right to hear um, charges that are put in front of you, uh, the right to be able to actually have your side of the matter heard, uh, also the right that you have for timely resolution of your matter. Now, due process uh, is, it, it goes back a very, very long way, but it's evolved over time, and certainly, in, and describing here the the use of due process in the criminal sense, um, the Magna Carta, in fact, enshrined some of our rights. For example, what they call the writ of habeas corpus, the right for a person to be brought before the court. That's a fundamental right in our legal system. And really, that exists to prevent and protect us from the legislature and the executive just arbitrarily imprisoning us. Now, the uh, other aspects of due process, for example, include the right to have an impartial arbiter. When going to the courts, uh, part of due process is that that person who's deciding the matter shouldn't have an interest in the particular result. In other words, the arbiter should be impartial in some way, in, in, in all ways, in relation to us. They shouldn't care which way they are going to decide and now partially the aims of and the importance of due process in our system it's really to uphold uh, the rights of citizens and protect the citizen against i guess the the tyranny of arbitrary government now this idea of arbitrary government this is a, a theme which has come out throughout this uh, this entire subject uh, because Originally, if we go back to systems of autocracy, where you've got literally you know, one great ruler, King William of Normandy, um, that is the absolute power of the state vested in one person, and citizens, even the concept of the citizen, didn't even exist. And over time, this concept of citizenship is really evolved as being this packet of rights that we have. And a very fundamental one is for the um, the legal system and, and the court system in particular to demonstrate um, due process through following and upholding these series of rules and principles. Now another area where this concept of due process and procedural fairness comes up in, is in the substantive area known as administrative law. And here I'm really referring to uh, two concepts of judicial review and merits review. It's that idea that decisions made by the executive arm of government have to be made according to law. And part of them making those decisions that must be according to law is that they have to follow these rules of procedural fairness. And it's a very important uh, tradition that uh, we have in our legal system giving our courts the power to do this because it, it really it, it's a very important aspect of the separation of powers curtailing the power of the executive by giving the citizen the right to go to the courts in order to really make sure those decisions have been made properly and most importantly they've been made fairly 
In other words, these principles of natural justice and procedural fairness have been followed. Uh, the decision maker isn't biased. The, the person has a right um, to, you know, to be heard, to actually submit evidence before the particular decision maker. And in situations where that hasn't been followed, for them to be able to, to actually go examine the results and have them, have them checked, have them reviewed. I'll just spend a bit of time now talking about the, uh, I guess, the fundamental issue with access to justice. Now, this is less of a, a series of procedures and really more of a, um, a philosophical and political uh, framework that we put in place in Australia. Now, there's a great quote uh, that you can see on the um, on the slides there. The law and its majestic equality forbids the rich as well as the poor to beg in the streets, steal bread, or sleep under bridges. Um, and it's a really important consideration because it, in a simpler sense, poor people can't afford the same level of legal representation that rich people can. So this notion we have in a democratic tradition that we, the citizen, is equal before the law that whole concept of the rule of law, in many ways, can be seriously undermined by the inequality of resources in relation to access to legal representation and fundamentally access to justice. And so there's this, there's this clash, really, between the idea that we have, as citizens, we have right, we are all equal before the law, um, and in bringing actions against us, the Crown, um, you know, it uses the same resources against the rich and against the poor. But fundamentally, though, we know that's something in our system of a myth. People who you know, have access to a significant amount of funds can afford um, a more structured, more sophisticated, more experienced legal practitioners um, to help uh, represent them. Also, in the civil sphere, two sides that may be disputing um, over a particular uh, uh, matter, the side with more cash can essentially run the matter for a lot longer. If we think of it like, um, like almost like medieval warfare, where you have an army sieging the city, the, the, uh, the winner is going to be the person who has the best provisions, the army that's best supplied. And so that can be, and often is the case in civil matters, particularly those that run over a, a long amount of time, that parties, one or the other, can simply run out of cash. And so the results can be you know, really quite unjust as a, uh, as a result of this. Now, structures that we put in place to resolve this um, often take the form of community legal organisations, with the most uh, well-known being legal aid, funded by the state and federal governments in order to provide free uh, legal representation um, to people. Now, in Australia, the case of, of Dietrich um, did establish that citizens don't actually have a right, a fundamental right, to have free legal re representation. It's actually not in, um, a, a, a hallmark or an entrenched um, component of our legal system. However, in most courts, for people that, particularly those that are um, experiencing or uh, being charged of a summary matter, a, a minor criminal offence, there is what's called uh, a duty lawyer. Um, uh, people, usually local solicitors, that are hired through, uh, through the legal aid budget um, to attend to matters where people are just simply rocked up on the day. Now, as well as this idea of having um, on-the-day assistance for people, and uh, to be honest, it, it's never going to be as extensive as solicitors that uh, people have paid in advance and prepared in advance, because those people have just simply more resources, more time to create um, better arguments. Um, but other systems that are, are put in place in order to sort of help people out are the various community legal organisations. Now, some of these are established uh, for particular um, purposes or particular needs of some subcategory or class of citizen. For example, uh, uh, 
Advocacy Australia is an organisation that um, assists those with disabilities. Uh, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Legal System uh, Service that provides um, free representation for people who fall into those categories. There are also specific women's legal um, centres and systems. Now, um, in Queensland, the Queensland Public Interest Law Clearinghouse, or QPILCH, uh, facilitates uh, uh, several of these sort of roles in that they have specific clinics, for example, for people with um, uh, mental health, people with uh, are undergoing um, visa and refugee situations. They have a specific clinic for homeless people. Um, uh, s they specifically handle pro bono work, so people that are seeking for barristers and solicitors to do work, usually in situations where there is a great deal of public interest. QPILCH is funded to do that. And it's also funded to assist people uh, who are self-represented litigants. Now it's something that um, the courts are very aware of and the various states and, and certainly the, the federal government as well are aware of this increase in people representing themselves uh, in the courts, particularly in the higher courts, and the need to um, really ameliorate the difficulty of people to do that. Um, and it's problematic because, uh, simply put, those without a structured legal education and background are simply going to be at a disadvantage when trying to, uh, to bring a matter uh, by themselves. And so part of these sort of community legal organisations is to really step in and really assist people who are bringing their own matters but help them with the procedural aspects of what they're trying to do and trying to, to achieve because it's, it's not uncommon for self-represented self litigants to really get um, tripped up by a lot of the formal procedural aspects uh, of the court, of the filling in of forms and also the structured rules of evidence. Now, finally, I'll, I'll talk about um, ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution. Uh, again, this is an umbrella term. It's um, an area where basically parties ideally don't want to go to court. Uh, that's fundamentally what ADR I is about. It's about trying to resolve disputes in a, a host of different ways to prevent the um, stressful, slow and extremely expensive process of going to court and and in our adversarial system um, uh, you know when when two parties go to court you're going to have one winner and one loser and so some important tenets of ADR are to really try and um, try and just really bypass that entire process now ADR is is made up of a wide variety of different techniques for trying to have the parties resolve the disputes between themselves ahead of time, to do it in a timely manner, and uh, do it for a much cheaper um, result to both the, the two parties in dispute as well as to the taxpayer in terms of um, avoiding the court. Um, and also though, I think it's, it's helpful to note that sometimes ADR uh, processes and procedures can be um, can actually have some win-win situations, particularly when the actual things that the, each of the two parties are trying to achieve, uh, if they'd actually just sat and talked about it, they may find that they could uh, this both sides could actually win the particular dispute. Um, and so ADR ranges from just very simple, essentially negotiated, structured negotiations between the parties. Um, and it ranges towards very, very, very formal, almost more court-like um, procedures. So from negotiation, you can move on to having mediation, which is essentially negotiation with a trained mediator, who again is impartial and is there to try and help resolve um, the two parties dispute, usually in a non-legal uh, way. However, the parties can go to uh, another step where rather than have a non-legal mediator to actually have um, a, a person with legal training actually go and appraise each of the two cases. You can have this expert appraisal. Um, but 
with a lot of these systems, it's still not binding. Even if the expert comes back and says, well, party A, your case is much, much stronger than party B's. Um, that's really um, helpful in terms of the two trying to come to a, a resolution. Um, but people can be stubborn. Um, there are still more formal arrangements. For example, matters can go to arbitration and then adjudication. So systems which uh, start to resemble uh, the courts. They actually start to um, have structured systems in place where the parties bring evidence and they have an arbiter and that person makes a determination of, of some sort. And some of those determinations can have some sort of legal effect. And that's really um, an important part of, of uh, I guess, contemporary legal practice. This idea of embedding uh, ADR um, uh, mechanisms inside the, um, the judicial system. For example, when trying to bring matters in, say, the family court, um, parties are obliged to actually go and seek and um, have conducted uh, mediation sessions. Um, similarly, employment disputes. There are, is a requirement that these things go um, to uh, various adjudicators prior to actually going to the courts for them to resolve um, the matter where the parties still can't make their minds up. And so it's a very important component in our, uh, in our legal system. And moving forward, ADR is a, certainly a burgeoning area. And it's for those that are seeking to enter the legal profession, it's a, a very useful um, uh, series and systems of, and uh, techniques to really become familiar with at an early stage in your degree um, because these things will come up time and time again and even very experienced legal practitioners are often involved in the, in the non-court um, dispute resolution mechanisms.